I would like to thank all of you for inviting me here today and giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts with you. And uh, I hope you're as glad to hear me when I'm done uh, as you are right now. <laughs> uh, so I was raised in the city of Tacoma. And it's funny because Tacoma, in a lot of ways, is a world away from both the policy world in Olympia and then the glitz and glamour of Amazonia, uh, sorry, uh -huh. Seattle, um, which is you know 30 miles to the south and 30 miles to the north. One of the things I always think about is that when I stand in front of my students, uh, I'm standing in front of a group of students, 80% of whom live in poverty, uh, who speak about 12 different languages, 10% of whom's parents are college graduates, and another 10% of whom are homeless at one point during the year. Uh, so as a teacher, I see how a lack of predictability and can make long-term planning for students difficult, and it can make it very hard for students to focus on the minutia of school sometimes. I also see the impact of often well-intended, but sometimes poorly implemented and designed ed policy that comes down from the state level. So given that as context, uh, just the one thing that I would like to say to you all is, is that in the absence of the elimination of poverty, the single most important thing that we can do to improve the outcomes for our students is to build intentional supports to identify, retain, impactful, and effective educators. It's, it's really funny. Um, I think of sports metaphors a lot, and we never use poverty as an excuse for sports. My two favorite athletes, Lionel Messi, Marshawn Lynch, grew up in abject poverty in Oakland and in the barrios of Argentina. But we don't think that it's a miracle that they became professional athletes and the best in their fields through world-class coaching. It should be the same way with teaching. If somebody can become a world-class soccer player or running back, they should be able to become a world-class historian or accountant or app designer through world-class teaching. Education has the ability to, trans to transcend poverty if we let it. Another thing that I would say is, is that I believe that teacher quality is the number one in-school factor that's impacting student achievement. Teacher quality is more important than the standards, more important than the curriculum choices, and effective teachers can produce two to three years of growth from a student over an average teacher. If we believe that's true, then I think it's really important that we do whatever we can to make sure that our most effective teachers are put in front of our most needy students. And right now, the systems aren't designed that way. I work at Lincoln High School, and at Lincoln High School, uh, we have a soaring graduation rate. We're up near about 83% right now. We've created a post-secondary culture where our students are looking at not just university, but community college, and also vocational school. And in fact, I have a kid right now, um, I'll call him Ike, whose uh, email actually just popped up right here, he, he's, emailing, he's emailing questions about how to fill out an application for an apprenticeship to be an electrician. Ike is going to make more money than I make in about five months. <laughs> uh, also at Lincoln, 40% of our students are enrolled in AP classes. All of this is happening as the economic conditions of our students worsen over years. Since I have got to Lincoln High School seven years ago, the poverty rates climbed about 10%. So, through teacher quality and through the efforts of teachers, we're showing that even though the kids are doing worse economically, they can do better academically. If I believe in teacher quality, I also have to emphasize that I believe the most important way to improve teacher quality is through high quality, ongoing PD. But the problem is, is that too much of the PD that teachers get right now is one size fits all and aims for the bottom and the middle. With better PD, I've seen it, we can make good teachers into great teachers. That's not going to happen through sit and gets, and it's not going to happen through drive-by PowerPoints from Cap for, with Kelly from Kansas. Now, the state legislature has done a little bit in getting us here. Uh, this year, they passed House Bill 1345, and House Bill 1345 creates a basic definition of PD, PD that is ongoing, job embedded, and relevant to teachers' content, and that's a good start, but it's not enough. Thirdly, and this might be the most controversial point is, is that I think we've gone, all, gone about resolving issues of teacher quality all wrong. It seems like all of the policies that we create to address teacher quality aim for the bottom. In doing so, we're making the jobs of effective educators actually more hard. In Washington State, we have a, we have a teacher shortage. And one of the reasons we have a shortage is, is that the career field has lost esteem in the view of the public. Now, to remedy the shortage, you have two levers. And I think of metaphors in my classroom. You have this lever you can pull, this is the supply lever. The supply lever lowers the requirements to become a teacher, opens up reciprocity to every state regardless of anything they have, as long as they're licensed, and then offers the opportunity for fly-by-night certification programs to come into Washington State, like they have in Arizona and other places. I don't want to pull that lever. Lever two takes money, and lever two is investing in education and educators and making teaching a rewarding place that people want to stay and thrive. Now, 
this lever, what it's going to do is, is those low quality teachers who have, uh, you know, fly by the fly by night certifications, they're going to end up at our highest need schools with our highest need students. They're going to end up at the Lincolns around the state. No world class organization got that way by focusing on the bottom. I, 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 just, I, I just can't, I can't say that enough. I, I can't think of a single world class organization that became world class by obsessing at the bottom and the lowest performers. Again, a sports metaphor. I think about the Seahawks. So, born in Tacoma, been a Hawks fan all my life. There have been some lean years, y'all. Some <laughs> lean years. Uh, I remember 2009, Hawks went 5 and 11. 5 and 11. What did they do? They fired their coach. They hired Pete Carroll. What did Pete Carroll do? Pete Carroll brought in quality on both sides of the ball and then didn't micromanage them. He let them be themselves. He let Marshawn be Marshawn. Uh, he let Russ and Bennett lead on both sides of the ball. He didn't try to silence Sherman. He allowed, he, he brought in quality people and then let them do the work their way. The Hawks focus on identifying talent and now the Hawks play more undrafted players than any other team in football. One of the priorities that I've heard spoken about in education in Washington State is diversifying the teacher profession. The pathway the Hawks have laid for us is the same pathway. If we want to diversify the profession, we need to be looking at our schools and putting kids of color on a track to becoming teachers. But here's the catch. Let's take a real story that I heard from a girl in Yakima. Uh, she lives in Yakima Valley. She went to the University of Washington, and she majored in mathematics to go back and become a math teacher. Now she's facing the reality of graduating with $40,000 in debt, and then taking a job that the state allocates only $36,000 a year to. Come on. I've heard about the initiative from the White House, Computer Science for All. I love the idea of Computer Science for All. I love the idea of computer science in every school in America. Who's going to teach it? Who with a degree in computer science is going to work for $36,000 a year, $41,000 a year, when they can go to Seattle or go to San Francisco or go almost anywhere and work in industry? I feel like we've kind of forgotten about the, the bargain that teachers make. Essentially, particularly our high, our high, sorry, our high poverty schools are kind of underpinned by this ongoing, uh, we'll call it mutual contract. Teachers know that the work they're doing is important, and because they want to make a difference, they're willing to accept the low market pay. But what is happening is the policy environment is disrupting that environment. And instead, you have teachers, especially effective teachers, who are being offered below market pay, but then are having their work dictated to them micromanaged. And that leads to low morale in the classrooms. I'm being headhunted right now. Effective educators are being headhunted by corporations because effective educators have three things. The ability to communicate, the ability to collaborate, and the ability to long-term plan. If we don't treat our effective educators better, we're going to lose them. The number one focus of policymakers should be to ensure that every classroom has a high-quality educator. However, often the policies we take do the opposite. Almost every structural incentive right now to an effective educator at a high poverty school is to go to the suburbs. Because in the suburbs, the kids' needs are met, the schools are better funded, and the work is sustainable. As a teacher in a high poverty school, I think my students deserve the best possible instruction and the best possible teachers. But what's happening right now is a lot of our high poverty schools are burnout factories. One of the things that I'd really like to see done is I'd like to see the inclusion of more teacher voice in education policy. With that in mind, because I, you know, it, it's funny coming to, the, to, to, to you all today. I had to sit down and say, okay, this is the state board, which is different than OSBI, which is different than the PESBI board, which is different than the legislature, and think about like where your focus is. So I asked five of my colleagues, uh, if you could talk to the state board, what would you want them to hear? The first thing was about testing. So I'm not one of those anti-testing people, and most of my colleagues aren't. Our problem isn't testing. Now, I don't think there's a lot of people who are anti-testing like as an existing thing, but we do have issues with, with redundancy. And in fact, a colleague sent me our assessment calendar for September. I'm oh, sorry, for, uh, for the spring. And so this is Lincoln High School's assessment calendar and all the testing that's going to happen with our students. And so I, I know there's a role for tests and we need data from assessments, but like there has to be a better way. And I also understand that we're in the kind of this weird period where the uh, the history is being phased out and the SBAC is coming in, but like this calendar punishes students. Uh, in particular, I'm reminded of a young lady who I'll call Grace. Uh, I'm an advisor for her, I've known her uh, since she got to Lincoln, and she's a junior this year. So as a junior this year, she is taking, she's already taking the PSAT, 
she got good PSAT scores, which means she wanted to take the SAT. Her college prep advisor is reminding her and advising her to take the ACT. She's planning to run and start, which means she needs to take the Compass. Uh, in the back of her head, a military career is there, so she's taking the ASVAB. She also is going to take the SBAC. She's also going to take the AP Lit exam. She's also going to take the AP US exam. There has to be a better way. Um, another teacher said that one of the issues we have is teacher induction. There's a lot of talk in the media right now about teacher preparation, and I'm not sure the prep programs are the problem. I think it's the way that we just release first year teachers kind of on their own. Uh, we need to create intentional programs where we slow release the uh, beginning educators in the classroom. I did some research, and only four states nationwide have intentional induction programs for beginning teachers, and Washington State's not one of them. Uh, another thing the teacher brought up was the issue of absenteeism. And absenteeism of students is a silent crisis in our schools today, particularly in our high poverty schools. So my poverty schools have absenteeism rates of 25%. Think about you as a teacher. Think about you preparing a lesson. Think about what it's like when every day a quarter of your class is gone. Think about how that affects uh, what learning targets you can address. Think about how that makes your learning be uh, to, to go in loops constantly. But there's really no conversation about absenteeism. We've seen what can happen when people tackle absenteeism. And I'm going to argue that tackling absenteeism is one of the biggest bang for the dollar impact programs that we could have in the state of Washington. Quick example. A friend of mine works at Clover Park High School. Uh, they had an absentee, absentee problem. They basically took one of their paras and reassigned their, that para for first and second period. And all that para did was call the homes of students who were absent first and second period. Guess what started happening? Kids started showing up. But there's no statewide passion right now about absenteeism, and it hits our highest poverty schools the most. The last two things that were brought up by my colleagues kind of overlap each other. Um, one of my colleagues talked about the policymaking process and how today the policymaking process essentially is groups like you all, groups like the Petty Board, and the legislature come together and they create policies with some teacher input and then kind of just drop the policies in the district and say, okay, go ahead. One of the things my colleague would like to see is the creation of teacher advisory councils for each of the policymaking institutions. So the House Ed, sorry, the House Ed Committee would have an advisory council of effective educators. The Senate Ed Committee would have an advisory council of effective educators. You all, PESI Board, and OSBI. I feel like if we got teacher voice in the conversation before the implementation phase, in the design phase, there would be less resistance to policies. Uh, the last thing that one of my colleagues asked me to bring up is the mess right now of college in the classroom. So if you, have, if you work at a high school, there's about 14 different dual credit options that a student can use. There is Running Start, where we take our most knowledgeable students and effective students and take them out of the high school and put them in community college. Not a big fan. There is dual credit college in the classroom uh, offered by Central Washington and UW. There's AP, there's IB, there's CT dual credit certification programs. It's really kind of a mess, and nobody has real oversight and is giving students good advice about which program outcomes and which programs best suit them. My friends, these are the things that effective educators are worried about. And these are the things that we think can move the needle for kids. We're not talking about charters, and we're not talking about common course bats. Like, those things aren't what impact my kids in my practice. I implore you. I, I, I appreciate you having me here today, but this shouldn't be the only time that we have this conversation. I implore you, please, whatever you can do to include the voices of effective teachers in the policy making process will benefit our schools and our communities. I'll close with this. Effective teachers, put, when put in high poverty environments, can transform lives. Everything that we do should be about putting our best in front of our neediest. And if we aren't doing that, we're failing them both. Thanks.